Let's continue with our talks. We have very, you know, we're a bit out of time schedule. Uh, the ambassador um, will have a short message for you, um, which I would like to give him opportunity to you. And also I would like to introduce Maurizio Bortolotti, my dear colleague from Milan, uh, curator and professor at NABA at Francesco's faculty, the media faculty, uh, with whom I've closely worked to, to prepare this, um, these two talks. And he will introduce our second panelists. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you might by now think that the ambassador would like to steal the floor, which is not the case. Uh, from now on, I will keep silent. But there's one more thing that I would like to share with you, and that is the following. And it's something very special that still exists in Turkey and not uh, in many more countries in the world anymore. I received a telegram right here. And I'm not going to read it to you because it's in Turkish, and my Turkish is quite feeble. Um, but I know what's in it because I have a very um, adequate staff who uh, translated the text to me. So I'll not read it literally, but it's a telegram uh, sent by uh, Minister Egemen Baish, who is the um, European Affairs Minister in the, in the Turkish uh, cabinet for the second time. And... Um, he would like to uh, greet all of you because he thinks that this initiative of discussing um, not only art but also structures in which art is presented is uh, very important. So he wishes you, he wishes us all the best and um, he hopes to join in two years. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Um, well, so I would like to just shortly introduce uh, our guest. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, all of you that we are here attending this uh, s uh, panel, the first one and this second one. And, uh, and I would like to thank also uh, all the colleagues that are here from the art world. And especially, I'm very honored that they are here um, uh, Bons Krishnamachari, the artistic director of the new Kochi Biennial that is in preparation for the next year in India, in November, that we're going to open in November 2012, and Shwetal Patel, um, that is uh, officer um, uh, director of the Biennial, um, and also curator. Um, so, uh, thanks a lot for coming to everybody. And um, now I'd like to introduce um, our guest, so we have this uh, structure that is similar. We have um, uh, Yung Wuli. Uh, Yung Wuli is a um, curator and uh, is a professor and is uh, founder and president of the Gwangju Biennale in Korea, in South Korea. It is the most important uh, Asian Biennale. And uh, <coughs> thank you for coming, Yung Wu. And then uh, we have Marta Rosler. Marta is very well-known artist, and she works a lot, she works a lot, also, and she works to still, uh, and, uh, and especially in the connection. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 let me finish. <laughs> <laughs> on the, I mean, especially focusing on the connection between uh, uh, media and, um, and art, uh, and art, I would say, let's try to sum up this. It's not just that, but I mean, for our conversation today, it's very important, this aspect. And then we have Lanfranco Ceti. Lanfranco is a professor, is an expert in media, theorist in media, and a professor in the Goldsmith College and uh, um, Sabanci University here in Istanbul. And uh, is also artistic director of EASIA 2011, that is, um, that is the, org the organizer of this uh, conference uh, um, together with many other events here. So we are particularly honored to have him here. Um, so, okay, this is the presentation. Um, the second, this second panel, um, in a certain way, uh, try to develop the first one in a sense that, as we probably have seen uh, in, the co in the presentation, um, in the press release, there is this idea to organize panel about the connection between the, uh, the Biennale, biennials, and media. I mean, that's the, the main frame. Because I'm, I'm, I was thinking, and I think this is a kind of very fundamental fact, the, f the, the question that we discussed uh, uh, with the moderation of Marike in the first panel, 
the f uh, about censorship especially, the structure of biennials and the problem of censorship in biennials. I think that this um, wouldn't be possible without the, the, the existence of media, because media can spread around fastly, uh, fast, many, uh, not only information, but the situation is much more complex, and now we try to uh, to, um, to deal with some issue that can be arised by the, p the presence of media inside the biennials. And uh, so I think that the background, also the first discussion, was really related to the importance and influence of media in biennials and the art pro world today. <coughs> so just for gi giving you a short um, introduction now, I would like to start uh, with uh, Yung Wu Lee. And uh, Yung Wu Lee is a president of the one, a founder, a president of one of very well established biennial in Asia. Um, uh, and uh, recently he um, invited as artistic director of the just open Guangzhou Design Biennale, either way, to work there. First of all, I would like to ask you, uh, uh, Jung Wo, how is either way now? And uh, can he come to the opening, travel uh, and working abroad, and then come into the opening of the Guangzhou Design Biennale? Or he had some problem? Well, our area is becoming another hot issue at this table. Well, uh, as you all know, he has a free travel restrictions. Uh, he, since he was released on bail after 81 days custody, he has been living and working in his Beijing studio, tight, it's subject to tight control. And uh, uh, he wanted to come to the opening of the Guangzhou Biennale, but he couldn't make it, unfortunately. Uh, days ago, I talked to him. He was telling me an interesting story that uh, he was walking the street and a few of people came up to him and gave him thumbs up like this without talking. And then they uh, patted on his shoulder without talking again. And then he was saying to me, what are, they, what are they waiting for? No one is willing to speak out. And then uh, they just give him thumbs up like this. What does this mean? means uh, I'm, I'm just fucked by the government, something like that. And anyway, it seems like an enduring moment for him, stuck in a designated area uh, without any kind of freedom of speech. But as you know, he's been like a champion of the tweeting, but he's slightly coming back to where he was. He actually he was one of the uh, two design Biennale directors, and he has been contributing a lot to the formation of the Design Biennale, Guangzhou Design Biennale, including the setting up the theme of the Biennale, the theme of the Guangzhou Biennale. He made, he coined is, design is design is not design, which was excerpted from the first sentence of the Tao Te Ching. You probably know Tao Te Ching. It is a book written by the ancient Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu. So people started to make, make use of that, make fun of that duplicating the meaning of it. Like, uh, Maurizio is Maurizio, is not always Maurizio, something like that. And uh, I can see a uh, distinguished curator, Maria Lind. Maria Lind is Maria Lind, is not always Maria Lind, something like that. Anyway, uh, we made an opening ceremony without him, but uh, he really concretely structured the design Biennale by inviting like uh, 134 artists, designers, filmmakers, architects from all over the world. And then one of 134 artists is Juliana Sanji, something like that. And then there were like a five artists who hasn't been able to come over to, to the opening of the Biennale due to some, some political reasons, including Ai Weiwei. Thank you, Yung Wo. Actually, I would like to just go a little bit further on this question because uh, we introduced uh, quickly uh, Ai Weiwei. Uh, but of course, I wanted to continue on this, uh, on this way and taking either way as a kind of point of reference, uh, connecting the, press, uh, the, um, the, the other panel about censorship and Biennalian censorship and the, um, the, the work and the life in some way, if you or professional life of either way. Uh, so I'd like to ask you your opinion um, um, for you, which is the influence of Twitter and Facebook in the either way work and the fa not only in the structure of the work, but particularly in the fact that the world became much more uh, notorious, and also this position uh, became a little, I mean, uh, became so critical, also because it's uh, fame around, and uh, fame. Fame. 
Yeah. So, um, so I think it could be interesting to know your opinion about the, uh, the influence uh, of one of the new media like uh, Twitter and uh, in this uh, special case connected with Iowa. So what do you think? <laughs> what, what made today's Iowa must be social media. We all know that. And he's the best known for his, his tweeting account. And whatever, he made a kind of deal with the Chinese authority. And we don't see him in Twitter that much, as he has appeared often before. And uh, he used to have like a tens of thousands of followers. The highest number recorded was 67,000. And then he wanted to have a direct contact with followers. But uh, since he was released in June this year, he's almost unable to make it. But it's, it doesn't appear that he uh, made a, like a, a concrete deal with the Chinese government that uh, he cannot use like uh, the newest, uh, newest kit of technology, which is uh, uh, Google Plus. So timely, he made a comment on the situation in China by using very much a satirical uh, address, like uh, China is, uh, is hopeless, China's nightmare, constantly nightmare. We know China is not constantly nightmare, but uh, he was using that kind of phrase. Okay, thank you very much, Yung Guo. Um, so uh, the second question is for uh, Marta. And, uh, and especially I would like to ask something, I mean, connected with uh, uh, her works that, that they are in the Biennale, uh, in this Biennale. I, I guess that many of us uh, have seen them. Maybe Marta can show some of them, the, the works that they are in the Biennale now. And because I think it's very interesting um, and focus on the fact that Marta used uh, really much the, the idea of media inside his, her work, not only not only in terms of the image, they are, uh, they are uh, collage, they seem, can, can seem also photo montage or something like that, but also the fact that these uh, images that you uh, have seen in the Biennale and uh, in, in, the, in some frames, like, uh, uh, I mean, <coughs> like paintings, not, I mean, this is like a traditional way to, to show, actually they were born and uh, to, be, um, to be spread around inside newspaper. That's very interesting because we are talking uh, about pieces realizing 67 around that time. So uh, we are not talking about uh, uh, recent things. We, we have our Im images later. But uh, so I think it's very interesting uh, ask, to ask um, to Marta, which is the influence in, in, uh, of the media in her work, and uh, if possible for you to try to uh, analyze the different la layers that are inside uh, your work, different layers of influence of you in your work by, of the media. As you can see, I decided, uh, thank you for the introduction and so on. I know we're short on time, so I decided to show not the body of work alone that addresses directly the concept of, uh, the, and the fact of uh, a war in distant lands that is the U.S. Uh, invasion in Vietnam and the pursuit of that, but also the other relationship I had uh, preceding to images of women in the media. Uh, all these works actually are, are about representation. This is a cliche now, but in the mid-60s, this was not such an apparent thing to be doing. Uh, so the images that I've shown that deal with the body of women or uh, other elements of magazine and newspaper representation um, clearly have to do with the uh, reminder to the audience that there are multiple realities that we keep segmented. This is very clear and very obvious. It's not in any way about telling you about things you don't know, but of asking you to think about the things that you actually do know. Uh, I don't know how much more you want me to say about these, but I'll continue to show no, some Maybe of you can tell something about the process to, pro to produce these images yes, and uh, well, how I actually showed a couple like of the uh, sources of some of them, uh, and in order to do that with this series, I'm going to go back and just remind you of some of the sources. 
particularly of this, I chose this image to say, um, so very simple, uh, an image from an architectural magazine, an image from, in fact, in this case, the cover of Life magazine, the most important magazine in America in this period. All uh, people of, of every class got their news and information from Life magazine at the same moment that television was also coming in to the home. But still images came primarily through these magazines. Um, so, and uh, as you probably realize as I rushed through this, uh, these works were disseminated either on photocopies, that is Xerox copies, uh, stacks of them at demonstrations, or in these newspapers uh, organized by people in my age cohort, uh, were things called underground or alternative press. So it was primarily underground press. And um, they just keep on keeping on. Uh, I would like to move a little bit forward. Obviously, some of them also come from, uh, this is a picture of the president's wife. This is Pat Nixon with a picture of Faye Dunaway in Bonnie and Clyde. So I was interested in drawing in other more metaphorical relationships <coughs> to the concept of war, because that film was seen by my age cohort as uh, representing the difference between the, uh, what was called the establishment generation and those of us who saw ourselves as completely in opposition to the forms of governance. Um, and um, I, oh, I you want me to not go on with these? I know I wanted to remain on this, and uh, we have a second question on the real oh. recent work, but um, just so I'm very curious to know uh, what, what was the, I mean, uh, the real necessity uh, to use uh, picture images they coming from uh, new media, they are talking about this strong reality like war, and compare them and connect them with the uh, I mean, everyday life or middle class, and uh, so I think that's um, a point quite is how can, uh, why, why they can work so much in a way so strong, I mean, for you, to use this kind of, of stuff to produce a, a piece of art? Why don't, for example, painting them? I thought that I would deal with the most vernacular and demotic forms of representation of conflict. These were meant as agitprop. They were not meant for a gallery display. They were meant to be handed out, as I said, on flyers in public and demonstrations and also to be reproduced in underground media. They were, as I said, a reminder of things we already know to whoever cares to look. They're still images. There is no real action occurring. They're not expressionist. They're not bloody. They're simply intended as a form of tableau, stopping motion and saying, please think you know this and to create that moment of conflict that was never addressed, which is the way we decide what we are entitled to in our lovely homes and what they are entitled to in that great hell of over there, wherever the war is occurring, where people are always looking different and dressing different, so. I don't know if okay. I answered your question. Thank you. No, I mean, no, I think that I think that's very, for me, a very key point, but okay. Why uh, not painting? Because I was an abstract painter at the time and it just didn't seem like the right mode of address. <laughs> 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 okay, thank you, thank you, Marta. <laughs> okay, um, now I have a third question, um, a third question for Lanfranco Cetti. Uh, Lanfranco is also a curator and artist. And um, but it's interesting to, um, to ask him question much more theoretical in relationship to media. And um, so, um, so today, I mean, in the media debate, there is this point that is the, the fact that the society in some ways re-representing itself through electronic media, so the kind of process of uh, re-representation that as a technical word is defined, remediation. 
in the in the in the, in the theory of media, and um, and in some way, so the image of our society has been transformed in a probably unexpected way or unpredictable way. Um, so my question is simply: uh, Do you think that something unexpected happened in this process of re-representation, remediation? And if yes, what effect this process has produced, in your view? Okay, um, this is a very actually it's a very com technically complicated question because um, um, we do some distinction. There are some distinction, and I belong to the MIT School of uh, Remediation slash Transmediation. I'm not going to bore people to death, but the difference is very very simple. Today you have multiple media, and uh, there are different ways. If you present content which is the same content across multiple media, that is a process of remediation. And then if you instead change the, con the content every single time that you present it across the TV, uh, Twitter, the Facebook, and etc., that is a process of transmediation because of the artworks, although being conceptually linked, they are different all the time. Um, what is happening, I mean, I mean, I believe that what is happening today, there are all different sorts of uh, um, different systems and platforms. Uh, we had a lecture today by MIT, Professor William Uricchio, and it was just exactly on this topic. We were looking at why uh, there is uh, a fear from the art world to different practices that are arriving uh, from social media, crowdsourcing. I was working at, I should probably not do the name, it doesn't be recorded, but I was working at the Victoria and Albert Museum. We were working on a collection now, the obsession of a collection is a process in which you evaluate the work, and these were new media artworks. My suggestion as a curator it was to place everything online and to ask to the community of commenting upon those artworks. Of, uh, um, and there are people that are still alive, although they're 95, they're still working alive, running. One person who comes to my mind is Chuck Suri. Um, and uh, to participate. The problem with that is that the um, hierarchical structure is removed from the curator, is removed from the concept of authorship, and you start having a different kind of approach, which is of a collective shared authorship with copyright problems, issues of censorship, issues of uh, property rights, and uh, more importantly is, in the end, who does the product belong to? And uh, for that reason, uh, we were not, it was not possible to actually do it, um, which is something that I, I have, in a way, regretted. So since then, I have actually tried to implement this form of participation, these form, forms of shared authorships. Um, and one example that could help is um, Chuck Suri. Um, he's right now 95. He received the Seagraph Life Award uh, this year. And uh, he's part of a program that we're doing in, uh, I think I can show you here, this location. And uh, he had a work that was done in 1967, which was called uh, Random War. At that time, the computers, computers did not have screens. So you had to plot the drawing. You had to imagine in your head write mathematical algorithms, send them in, and then you would see how the drawing would look like once it was printed. Now he has uh, remediated and transmediated the artwork to answer precisely to your question. It will be presented as a pre premiere, a world premiere for ICEA, uh, on the, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Zagreb. They have 100 long meters giant screens. And, uh, and it's done in what way? It's a combination of all uh, my friends in Facebook that are uh, these little actors that you see on the warriors that are fighting with each other. And what happens is you start seeing their name, um, their actions, some parts of their profile, and they are missing in action, wounded, dead, and etc. cetera. Um, it's so interesting to see today somebody that actually has uh, started this process uh, as an artist, as a fine artist, and thought that actually the, um, the new media requires a different uh, uh, response away from painting and to still continue to experiment with something like social media and, and Facebook. <coughs> I hope that answers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lanfranco, for your break. Um, yeah, so, um, 
I would like to restart now from um, from Yong Wali and um, and uh, I would like to uh, try to focus better this aspect of the of the media and biennials in the sense that we have seen um, how media are inside the biennial and the work of the by the artist uh, and uh, and how media can play a role in the in the context of biennials. But it is interesting also to think that biennial. Uh, works as a social media in the end, is itself a, a kind of media. So, um, so I want to ask uh, uh, to uh, to Young Wo in uh, Young Wo in your experience, uh, uh, could you try to define this biennial as a social media, and uh, and especially uh, try to focus on the meaning of participation today uh, in the in relationship to a biennial. Well, I think that the growth and emergence of uh, <coughs> urban art in, re in response to uh, social and the environmental urgency is shifting the work of art and artist. And the practitioners probably are challenged uh, to find the ways for art to contribute to communities and the culture in a local and global context. What we are talking about today is not only a BNL as a social media, as a platform, but also we're talking about the, the broader context of the arts today, how we have to face, we have to solve the problems of the biennial. And then I can think of some questions that are seriously and continuously raised. First one would be, what does it mean to pursue a, an art practice or identity as an artist and curators at this very moment uh, of the history. Secondly, how artwork has evolved aesthetically and situationally in support of or in reference to the culture of commodification and consumption, for example. I have read some this uh, article from a Eflux magazine, actually, and then they were talking about almost the same things. And then how have the roles of the art artist and audience and institutions have been resituated today. And uh, what is the potential for art to create a civic site for public discourses and expressions? Those applies to, to your question, what has to be dealt today's Biennale? And it, you briefly mentioned the participation. Uh, I think the term participation has become increasingly overused. And then when it comes to like uh, the context of the globalization and localization, the, the participant itself turns to like a, almost like nightmare because it becomes uncritical and innocent. Sometimes it's been used like romantic terms. So what is the real meaning of participation today? Participation exists between the producers and consumers. It exists between the, uh, the producers and artists and artists and curators, all that. So what is the real meaning of the participation? When everybody turns, has turned, been turned to the, the, the participant, and who, who are the consumers then? So it has to be applied in very correct meaning of the using the, the particip participation. Okay, thank you. <coughs> yeah, um, I think that this is also, um, I think, an issue that could be developed a little bit more. Uh, thinking the fact that, indeed, uh, biennial today is really kind of a um, big event that happens. A lot of people come here, a lot of, I mean, people writing a magazine and professional. So in the end, media become a kind of point for spread around a lot of, in, I mean, information about the art world. So it's working really much a big media like a newspaper or something like that, I mean, generally speaking. and. But it is interesting that the, this subtle uh, problem to connect the, the fact of the participation, the con connecting the, the dimension of participation with the con dimension of art inside. So I think that, <coughs> so do you think that the, the participation is, uh, uh, has to be in some way transformed in the future inside the biennial in a sense that uh, try to go beyond the traditional relationship between the audience coming to the opening, see the work and come back with the idea, I mean, opinion about the biennial? or there should be more interactive situation between uh, the project, the art project, and the, and, and the viewers, and the, and, the, and the people, the visitors? Well, one of the core discourses that the Vienna has been dealing 
so far is a participation. Mm -hmm. One of the main purposes is to produce a Biennale. For the Biennale creators, uh, the participation, any kind of participations. But what I was talking about was the overused, the meaning of the participation itself. Well, uh, for example, uh, when I was artist director, in terms of the creating very innovative form of participation in the form of a Biennale, before inviting artists, I have invited like a viewer participant, first of all. The official meaning was viewer participants. 60 viewer participants, including, uh, let's say, Canadian housewife or Dutch art teacher or Chinese farmer, Russian soldier, something like that. That was the first category, ordinary participants. Second category was uh, professional cultural art producers, including uh, filmmakers, fashion designers, professional writers. And the third category was uh, activists, environmental activists, human rights activists, and uh, media activists. And then I made a kind of form of a workshop in Gwangju. And then at the end of the workshop, I encouraged them to recommend artists to see in the Biennale, in the name of the Biennale, global, like a blockbuster show, let's say. Some of them did recommend it. For example, Russian, do we have in Russian here in this, in this room? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, to, I'm just telling you the truth, what happened there. One Russian soldier. <laughs> <laughs> told me he would like to recommend Leonardo da Vinci. So uh, I said, uh, it seems almost impossible for me to invite him to, the, to this Vietnam. And then uh, one uh, English farmer who's living in Devon, the south part of the UK, and he recommended Damien Hurst. So it was a perfect match. And then what happened to you? Why Damien Hurst? During the mad cow DGs, he lost 200 cows. And then whenever he see the Damien Hurst the piss, like a sliced the cows, and then he often reminds of the terrible experience that he had. And then uh, the American uh, writer, whose name is Richard Rhodes, he recommended an artist who's been developing like a atomo, atomic bomb making process. And the artist has actually been collecting a lot of uh, the materials from Los Alamos since like uh, 30 years. And then this Richard Rhodes, as a professor writer, he's like actually a Pulitzer Prize winner. And he recommended this artist. And then I've decided to invite him, something like that. So I really wanted to listen to the consumer of the Biennale as a producer of the Biennale. So what is the amalgamization between the producers and, and the consumers in between? So there is also active participation. As a result, I published a catalog. I put those like the participants and the artists together as a producer of the biennial. And then I have also included all different level of emails. They have corresponded each other. Some of them, they matched. Like a, they almost married together as an as a, as a, as a audience and then as an artist. But some of them had a serious discussion in the end one of case, a Slovenian artist and Slovenian view participant. They came to me and said they are ready to divorce. <laughs> and then I did not allow them to divorce, of course, because that was a very good example that uh, the consumers and the producers can create very unharmonious like, uh, uh, examples at the end of the dialogue. So something like that. This is one of the uh, very concrete examples that I've created in the name of the Bayanian. Thank you. I think this is uh, very interesting because um, this uh, biennial, I remember that I had visited in 2004, uh, it was a really experimental biennial in the sense that it was this is kind of experiment with, uh, with participa about participation. And uh, so I think it's very interesting because in, in a way, I mean, biennial as a social media become also really uh, a, a big lab in which uh, can, uh, we can test, uh, it's possible to test different models and also to use the concept of media to produce, um, to transform it in something active and working for the art world. So that's, I think, is very interesting. Um, so now, I mean, again, I, I'm Marta, and I would like to ask Marta to, uh, to show um, the other picture, uh, more recent, that, and the recent one, and uh, they are around 2004. And uh, also, I would like that uh, if it is possible for you, try to connect um, your, I mean, 
your work on this. Uh, you're, you're working on this, uh, on this, uh, producing this work, and connecting to the idea of censorship. Um, in two thousand and four, I was uh, invited uh, by two young curators to take part in an exhibition called Election, because naturally. Um, like good artists, we were all desperate to get Bush unelected, uh, hopeless task. And I was thinking, I was part of an artist group, Artists Against the War, where we collectively produced artworks, but uh, against the war in public spaces. I thought, I must do something on my own. What can I do? And I thought, well, the dumbest thing I can do is go back to 1970 and pick up the same process I used then and very little since, which is to make anti-war photo montages. And uh, the point being that not only would people say, what a dope she is, she has learned nothing, but that maybe they would stop and think that maybe we are dopes and we learned nothing. Uh, I also understood this time that I had a problem because their first home would be in art galleries and other <coughs> similar spaces, which was contradictory to my intention. But I also understood that they would wind up in mass media, and they did. And notice that this is uh, an article from the San Francisco Cron called A Look Back at the Vietnam War, and it was primarily a show about Vietnam, but they chose a montage that I made that year in 2004. Because of course, most sensible people were also anxious to both end this idiotic mistaken war uh, against, if anything, the wrong target and uh, also to unelect the president. I also understood that in other countries these uh, images would be in the media. And these are my, this is my source and uh, one of the results, so I'll just quickly cycle through a few of them. Um, it's identical to, um, there, there were, I think, a dozen of these in two, that I, I, once I start, I can't stop, I'm sorry, I'm, yeah, <laughs> obsessive that way. These are young uh, girls waiting online in Fallujah. This was a Bank of America high wealth assets advertisement with two little boys under uh, a table and they just joined. Um, you can see the burning tower in the background uh, under the um, Dutch still life. Um, this is an image taken, uh, as you probably all recognize from the internet, it's uh, Sergeant Lindy England, Private Lindy England in Abu Ghraib. Um, And in that same image, there are quite a number of other images, including some street posters um, called Iraq that riffed on the iPod advertisement. So, um, let's see, if it'll go backward or not. So, that's this. Um, And in this one is another internet image, which is American soldiers playing at the movie Ben-Hur before they invaded Fallujah for the second time. Um, and this incorporates these images and these images. And uh, in 2008, I was asked to contribute a cover to a magazine called Modern Painters uh, with uh, an image anti-war image, and I thought, well, I can't reuse something, it's absurd, so I asked for their dimensions. I'm not showing you the cover, I'm just showing you the image. And this was it. Uh, my daughter-in-law complained that I had included a bloody-handed woman. Uh, she said, you never do that. I said, yeah, but this is the cover of Modern Painters, the Painters Magazine, maybe they need a little more of a push. And this was a billboard image, um, again, to try and change the election in the state of Missouri. Did not go for President Obama, but we did win that one. And then this became a 20-foot banner. I don't have the original image with me. And a couple more, and then I will stop. The sorts of these two, it's a bridal gown and a woman um, and some British tanks. 
and um, and this is the source of the uh, so that was a diptych, yeah. Sure. It's a little explosion. It's okay. I'm almost done. And this because people were complaining that I was using too many female models. Why are you picking on female models? It's okay, I'll pick on male models. <laughs> okay, thank you, Martha. <clears throat> okay, um, yeah, I, I, so now it's turn again of Lanfranco, and to Lanfranco I would like to, uh, to ask another question and try to connect, I mean, Again, uh, a theoretical question about media with biennial. Um, I know that there is an interesting process today uh, in the um, narrative structure of film to kind of shift from the movie images from the cinema to the other media, really, really heavy. Uh, and for example, there's a, also a development in, a, in the art world with video maker, maybe video maker use taking from the cinema to make video and then develop the idea of cinema in another direction. There is the heavy use of internet, as uh, we already uh, said, and focus on as we said, and uh, like Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. So um, do you think that this process is very strong, very evident, how this process enter in the, mm, uh, in the biennials, in your opinion, you are a visitor of biennials. So I mean, I would like to know how to connect from your point of view, this uh, process that is happening and focusing by the theory of media uh, to the mm, to the biennial world and to the biennial structure of the of, the, of these kind of shows. Uh, actually, they don't. Um, they do not connect uh, normally. Uh, what has uh, happened here in Istanbul has been ex an extremely fortunate coincidence uh, of uh, um, a goodwill, a relationship built over two years' time. Um, I don't know, I'm pretty sure that when you go to biennials around the world, you see that uh, so-called art that is using new media, because new media art is a bit complicated, new media are 60 years old, so they're not new at all, um, but it's always marginal. They don't make it into the official programs, uh, they are invasions. Uh, and I'm thinking of, uh, um, you know, the group Manifestar that invaded the Biennale, or they invaded MoMA and with their augmented reality projects. So there are all of these different, uh, and it reminds me actually of Yayoi Kusama when she went to the Biennale in Italy and she created the Narcissus Garden and sh she actually was outside and it was an installation and uh, the police basically, she was selling the artworks for 50 liras Italian liras, which is 50 cents, and there were all these uh, sort of metal, uh, shiny balls uh, that covered the, an entire area, just right outside one of the pavilions, uh, on the border of being inside and outside the Biennale. Of course, uh, the artwork was removed. And um, so there is a strong tradition. It's a tradition of interventions uh, that the new media arts have actually taken from, inspired by processes of fluxus, uh, of video art interventions, uh, political art, uh, that have been reflected throughout the years uh, in photography first, film, and then video. So what is happening is that all of these new set of media um, are something that needs to be explored. And normally, they do not enter within institutional frameworks uh, for all set of reasons. Uh, um, we were discussing exactly this topic today. Why? What is the reason? Well, um, um, Professor Eureka was saying, well, it's a concept of authorship. It's the concept of uh, um, the fact that they are reproducible. So, uh, you know, you they don't really have commercial values. Well, actually, in the gallery, which is very interesting, um, there is a piece that is made uh, um, with a projection. It's a projection on a tripod. It's a clear reference to the movement of the fluxus in the 1970s. And what it does, it generates an image in real time of bacteria. So the video, you will not know because it, you know, on the caption there is nothing written about that. What you have, you're just looking at a video in real time that is showing you the life of bacteria. 
Um, and I find that extremely interesting because there is an aesthetic beauty. There, is a, a, there are a series of layers that create a composition that although unusual, is a still video and it's a still fascinating. But the technology does not necessarily have to be the main identifier. It's not what identifies the artwork. So in my opinion, there is a responsibility that also goes with the new media artists or the new media crowd that they strongly identify their aesthetic product with the technology, when instead the focus should be solely on the artwork and its aesthetic value. So I hope that what we have been able to achieve here will push um, towards that direction, because it was in the 1970s where the new media arts were invited for, th for the first time officially as parallel events to the Venice Biennale, and since then there hasn't been very much going on. Uh, so it's a 40 years lap that interestingly enough, for the first year, the Istanbul Biennale now has, uh, has, has bridged. Okay, thank you, Lomfranco. Um, yeah, I think that, uh, I mean, we have, uh, we, we did a second round of questions, so we are, I mean, going to a conclusion, but I mean, I think the conclusion actually is quite open in a sense that we try to uh, to focus the relationship between uh, biennials and uh, media from different point of view, and I think it's very interesting to reflect about the fact that some artists today very, uh, very interesting for their work, for their work, they are very much connected with the uh, use of, of media and uh, internet media like uh, Twitter, uh, we mentioned Highway Wave, for example, um, the f and the fact that the biennial itself could be a social media and inside a very strong and very delicate relationship in terms of participation, uh, th this word is very kind of uh, uh, really uh, sensitive word and sensible world, sorry, because it, it could be a really um, a point of mediation between the between the art production, uh, if you want to call it in this way, and uh, and um, and the rest of the society. They can see the show and can take part. Uh, they, they can uh, have uh, many questions to pose to themselves, as we see, uh, as we saw in the question related to the censorship. So, and other questions that are much more. Uh, if you want to technical, but in some way they take origin, as uh, Franco tried to explain, from the, uh, explain so better, and um, from the uh, practice and the, and the, and the, and the presence of, of this uh, transformation of media in our, uh, in, in our society, in the contemporary. So I will just mm, try to, um, to have, go as to a conclusion, just asking, Simple question to Mart again, <laughs> because uh, where we are, I mean, there's the Biennale here, uh, taking inspiration from Paris Gonzalez Torres, as uh, uh, we know, and uh, Martha was uh, uh, was relating some way to him. So I wouldn't ask to her uh, we, we, we what she thinks uh, the of, of the uh, her work is inside uh, the Paris Gonzalez Torres. I don't want to ask that. I do just that should talk about a little bit uh, about your relationship, your friendship or connection with him. I was his teacher. Please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, some more detail, please. <laughs> uh, in the Whitney program. Uh, because Mata is really influential for a generation of artists that come in after her. I mean, also, I mean, I would say also Ricky Trevanija is something to, to connect well, with. I her. was Rupert's teacher and, uh, and yeah. I was Felix's teacher. Of course, I wouldn't claim essential influence, but I will say that um, Felix said <laughs> uh, he was uh, interviewed by a mass media magazine, and he said that after studying with um, Martha Rossler and Yvonne Rayner, he didn't make any work for a year. <laughs> he saw it as a compliment. <laughs> and uh, he also became a member of group material and um, Doug Ashford who is a member of group material is also my student so um, I have a, a kind of a, something of a quasi parental if you want to put it that way or nurturant role to these uh, wonderful guys um, which of course brings me 
to the inevitable remark that it's not an accident that I showed you the feminist montages because there's only one type of war that seems to be a fashionable subject uh, in the world right now, and it's uh, a war that primarily involves guns, but there are other questions of inclusion um, that also need to be uh, remembered. And it's uh, sad when one form of uh, identitarian uh, uh, selection uh, effaces another. And when the internationalization of the biennial movement occurred, it seemed that the questions of gender identity and uh, in all its complexity and multiplicity lost some focus, partly I should think, because in many countries the question of what is gender identity at all is a vexed question and takes on political uh, issues, elements. Uh, and you notice I've gone far away. I want to say that um, in the Singapore Biennial, which I participated in in January of this year, February of this year, the subject was open house, and I invited uh, Singaporean women to together construct a very large community garden because women don't generally have a public presence ensemble in Singapore. So. Um, Felix was a wonderful and lovely man who uh, uh, was one of the first people actually to talk about the relationship between identity, sexuality, and public and, uh, and affective relations. So I think it's not so inappropriate for me to mention this. Thank you very much, Martha. Um, <laughs> So now we, um, we, uh, you know, we hear three um, um, very uh, specific point of view on the subject, on the main issue. So now it is open to questions from the audience. There are questions, yeah, yeah, just a second there, uh, bringing to you the microphone. Hi, my name is Royce Smith, and I have a question for the panel about what I noticed to be um, a very pleasant turn in this biennial, which is rather than having uh, a vague curatorial theme, um, which umbrellas everything and nothing at the same time, that there seemed to be a real conscious effort to return the biennial to the province of the artist. Um, probably one of the first biennials, only biennials that I know that, that, sp that sprung forth from the work, conceptual framework, and approach of an individual artist. Do you all see that as an important turn in biennial structure? And what sort of future do you think will, will come from this approach that this biennial has taken this year? Uh, the question is for who? Anybody who cares to answer. Okay, let's start from William Wu then. Yeah, he's talking about this guy. Well, I have uh, multiple answers actually, but uh, revealing my kind of criticism or praise or whatever it is, is not going to be that much obvious. Uh, I found this Istanbul Biennale, I don't know the like a practical con context in it, how it has been developed, like a, the theme itself or curatorial uh, philosophy in it. But uh, to me, uh, I have been able to witness like exhibition engineering, very strong, like functional exhibition engineering in it. And uh, I keep coming to see Istanbul Biennial since like almost 15 years. And then this edition of the Biennale looks much more refined show than any other existing Biennale before. In a way, uh, I understand there are not, not much contemporary art institutions, public institutions, including museums in Istanbul. And in a way, for the audience in Istanbul, it, it's going to be like a tremendously 
good occasion to get into the context of contemporary art today. Secondly, uh, I found this, uh, this edition of the Istanbul Vienna is like a bit uh, institutional show, like a museum show. And uh, in a way, uh, I have a strong idea. The biennial exhibition, whatever it is, no matter how it's like a global poster, blockbuster show or a small scale local show, whatever it is, it has to be very much different to museum shows. And then, uh, uh, although uh, complete uh, statistics are unavailable so far, according to a, a research conducted by the CAA, I found out there are like a two, over 200 internet, uh, the biennials in the world, small and big, global and domestic, and specialized biennials that present special media or craft, print, any kind of genre about photography. And then I was shocked at the number. Still, the number of the binary is increasing. And then what is the uh, Biennale fever that is uh, really uh, 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 encouraging us to make the binary? And what is the true relationship between cultural production and Biennale production? And why we are pouring lots of money into it? For what? For the audience, for the general public, for the producers, so the question can be arisen in deeper context. There are a lot of different layers that we can discuss, discuss about this, but uh, uh, certainly uh, what I found out through uh, this Istanbul Biennale is it's good for the audience, general public, the citizens in Istanbul, but for the professionals, I was a bit hungry in terms of seeking the real the notion of the cultural discourses in it. Marta? <coughs> I think it's possible for artists to say that um, it's nice to look at the works, but um, there's a bit of chafing under the fact that it actually seems like an arrangement by curators, that what we see is the hand and the sensibility of the curator. So it's nice that what you extracted from that was the individual contributions or ensemble of the artists. Thank you, La Franco. Yeah. I have probably to start by saying that uh, whenever you start with the artist, I will always like to end up with the artist. So whatever process the Biennale has done this year, I started with good intentions. So then, you know, you have, um, um, you have to look at all the set of conditions. Um, I don't think, you know, that it's, uh, that it's a bad thing to um, eliminate, and I shouldn't say this, the heavy hand of the curator at times. Um, so I'm all for, uh, you know, a biennale of the artist for the artist. <coughs> if this one has succeeded or not, that will have, will have to be seen. But I'm, I'm all in favor for it. Um, any other question? Um, I suggest that you prepare a formulated question just for one person, because a white who have three answers, I think it would be very <laughs> I mean, extensive. <laughs> uh, it's good to have all opinion, but yeah, please. Um, someone can give her the microphone. Thank you. I have a question for one of the curators. You were talking about um, participation, participation of the consumer of art um, that will, yeah, that, that made you um, decide which, um, which works to choose. Now in politics we see that um, a similar phenomenon has led to uh, politicians being ruled by the polls and they, they don't dare to take any risks anymore because they might not score so well in polls. Do you see that such a thing could happen in, in art, ex in, well, in your work as curators as well, that you would be um, led more by popular taste than by your own taste? Not in mine. <laughs> <laughs> at all, ever. Uh, then, 
um, then you know there are uh, there are other issues, other people that take in a different way. Also, you know about the polls, it's not that people are being led by the polls, the politicians in particular. They try to manipulate them and create a different kind of public opinion because they do not want to follow what the public would like. An example for everybody was Tony Blair and what happened during the uh, protests in order to. Um, you know, not to go to war. There was a march with the millions and millions and millions of people in London, and you know, nobody listened. So um, I, don't, I think that it's actually more of a process of negotiation, but no, I don't think that it would influence my choices at all. It's uh, something that you can take notice of, and then the final decision is with you and with the artist, uh, because I like to, to sort of, you're working together, you're invested together. I mean, this is what I think it's very, very important. I work with the artist, I like to promote the artist, I like to do as much as I can in order to make sure that they achieve that kind of visibility that promotes their work and promotes their career. And that's for me is, uh, is the duty of a curator. Then there are other people that see their duty of curator for, you know, in the restricted margins of their career or uh, as uh, star personalities that overshadow the work of, uh, of the artist within the show. So yeah, that's thank the way you. I think uh, about it. Oh, excuse me. Uh, thank you, uh, no, Ango. Actually, you have to curate the table, so I think that also Jungo Lidas is a, uh, I mean, a, a long career as a curator, and uh, so maybe he can add something. Well, I think you would have some ideas about the Italian situation. <laughs> 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 yeah, but as a moderator, I can't answer the question. <laughs> I don't think it is the case that I answer. Uh, if you want to add something, or? Well, I have nothing to say. Okay. Uh, okay. So. Um, there's a, actually, I have, uh, we have mm, the last last conclusion to the um, to the um, uh, the consulate, I think, and so uh, we have space for for another question if you have. Yes, please. Uh, just a second, the microphone, and please um, put the microphone quite close to the mouth, so it's better for you, for everybody okay. to hear. Um, I had a question for Martha Wessler. Um, I wanted to know, in between the, the, the major bodies of work that you showed us today, you had um, a desire to use of a very vernacular media that reached a wide audience. And with your work in the biennial, which I think, I mean, I think one of the limitations of the biennial model is that it can often reach only a limited audience, and the primary audience is the art world, addressing the art world. And do you have difficulty in deciding what work to do now? Like, do you want to address a mass audience with a mass media or participate in biennials where the impact or the, the audience that you reach might be actually smaller? I can be a three-ring circus. I don't need to do just one thing. I've done uh, web projects, uh, the Lab for Culture. European initiative, and uh, I make video. Um, I'm all singing and all dancing. Biennials are really interesting. They are international ships that sail from port to port, bringing messages and taking things on board, and uh, above all, bolstering national presences in the world uh, dialogue. So I think it's quite interesting. And I would like to just point out that I didn't choose the works that are shown here. That was the curatorial choice. But uh, I think biennials are a, f a, a universe of discourse in and of, uh, of themselves that uh, is uh, a global conversation. Okay. Mm -hmm. hey, thank you very much for your questions. Uh, so um, because it's quite late, I would like to invite the ambassador or the consulate to draw the last, last conclusion. Okay, so thanks to everybody for coming and thanks to our guests.